When talking about South America, we're talking about an area that's 7 million miles squared. It's typically split into the Andean region, which is north, central and south. And then you have the lowland rainforests and the coastal regions, east and west. It has rich indigenous cultures, which flourished until the Iberian conquest of the 15th and 16th century. Suits cause sport an artificial test with rules giving a goal. Therefore, Mesoamerican ancient games like blood sport for the gods can't really be considered a sport because for them, it, it was real, that was their life, it wasn't artificial. So when we talk about South American sports history, we're talking about things typically past the Iberian conquest. So the Iberians found the natives playing uh, sports like boxing, racing, wrestling, and, and some team activity. So they found them playing a, an early form of hockey, um, which is really, really fascinating. And the Iberians created this sort of axiological interpretation in which they saw the natives as secondary and started implementing their sports. Historically, what we call sport was integral to the indigenous cultures. And in 1988, the Brazilian constitution stated that it was the right of the Brazilian people in the state to safeguard these traditions. Typically, the Iberians repressed other cultures and other sports and imported their own games. So with me today is a man, a good friend of mine, Darren Fawkes. What he doesn't know about sport isn't worth knowing. He runs Focus Hoops. He commentates for the Lions. He podcasts. And he's a big fan of South American sport and specifically Argentinian football. So here we have Darren. How you doing? I'm all right. I'm OK. How are you, more importantly? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing really well. I'm just representing Racing Club Dabe Schneider. Well, that's the finest sporting society on the on the face of the earth. Wonderful. I'm I'm representing the Indiana Pacers, who are completely average. So <laughs> some, some things don't change, though, do they? So, of course, you're more well versed uh, in this than I am. What does sport mean to the people of South America? I mean, this is uh, you know obviously we're going to talk in big generalizations. I just want to make that really clear right now. And but. It's it's huge. It's absolutely enormous. And it and um and again, my my interest is largely Argentina with with a hint of of Uruguay, but predominantly Argentina. And it and it's absolutely massive, particularly football. But things like uh, motor racing is also really big. Um, field hockey in Argentina is also really popular. Like one of the big, well, the national team is fantastic. So what does it mean? It means a huge amount. It means a huge amount. Like people wear their football sleeves on their on their sleeves. And I, I said at the start, Racing Club Debe Schneider, the finest sports society in the world, because it's not a football club. Or it's not just a football club. It's a sports society. I am a socio. I am a member. My friend Nacho Tierno, who helps run the filial in London, he is a member of this sports society. That means that if you live uh, within 100 kilometers of the Cilindro, with the stadium that we uh, we I will say we when I refer to racing, and I'm not sorry about that. Where we play, you can use the facilities there. You you've got like a gym membership. You can go and play for the amateur football teams. You can, you know, take part in it. So it's an integral part of culture, an integral part of life for for quite a lot of South Americans, and again, particularly Argentines. But I know it's true for Chileans, Venezuelans. Plenty, plenty of yeah. South Americans. And, and, and you're right by identifying the fact that Brazil and Argentina will kind of get the lion's share of conversation here. But it is a fair statement to say that this is shared uh, across the continent. And of course, so we, we're talking about community. What is it, do you reckon, that helps build that community? Do you think it's something to do with the culture and the way that these people live or what the club does for the community? Well, what, what, what do you reckon is the motor behind that? So back in... 2018 i think was it 2018 could it have been 2018 i can't even remember when we set it up when when we set up the filial for london which is the sporting society a fan club essentially we met with representatives of the club and we had a very long four-hour intense meeting in spanish right a huge part of that meeting was the social work the club does um and again there are schools set up by the football club Again, we've got the sports societies. There are community projects. There's recycling. There's environmental projects. It's a huge part. And again, talking about racing, but I know this is true of the, the other grandes in Argentina and most of other football clubs. 
when there was uh, flooding in Buenos Aires a couple of years ago, racing players, the racing societies were there helping, delivering food, delivering sandbags, doing what they could. So it's these, yeah, the football clubs, they're not just football clubs like we see them in the UK. They are, you know, cornerstones of, of communities in some cases mm. with very rich histories and they're built into their barrios quite a lot where they, where they come from. Mm. Well, of course, it, that, that, that's such a, a binding factor because I imagine there's a lot of people that will be born and die with it, almost like the Bow Bells in London. They'll be born in your city or die in your city. And of course, therefore, what's integral to you? Well, it's, <laughs> it's the club that you're representing. Um, and I imagine, as, as we say, you know, people in Brazil are just as a fanatical about it. I think, do you think a lot of that is to do with the, the favela lifestyle with uh, your only real social release is football. You, you hear about Pele talking about, you know, playing with a tennis ball. And that's all he had really had to do. How much do you think that the way that their cities are set up, you know, are very different to the British ones? Do you think that plays much of a role? Um, from my understanding, and again, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to profess to be an expert. Um, but yes, it's it seems that way from from what I understand. Uh, the answer to that is is yes. Like football clubs, football pitches are safe spaces. Like you talk about the favelas of, let's say, Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo. They are safe community spaces. Yeah. Um, and yeah, football, of course, is a, is a way out. It's a release. Mm. And we see that in the UK. We see that with football in the UK. We see that with basketball in the UK. Jonah Lomu, a different context, but he had the same release with rugby. It was a safe space for him yeah. to be. So yeah, sport is, I think sport is the greatest thing in the world. I think it's the best thing in the world to be involved in sport in some capacity, be a fan, play, commentate you know this is the best job in the world yeah of course <laughs> but it's a release and it's just a good safe place to be or it should be mm. it should be a good place safe place to be and that's of course gets hasn't always been whomever of course it, it's interesting that you um bring that up because uh darcy frey in the last shot writes about coney islands that in in these section eight areas the only place where you know you're not going to get uh, you know approached shot at robbed is the basketball court and uh Zlatan Ibrahimovic in 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 I am Zlatan he writes the same you know he he grew up in a block of flats in you know some sort of brutalist area and the, the only place he, he knew he was safe was when he was down there on the football pitch at the foot of it so that, that kind of moves us uh on, on nicely do you do you think that it is more important sport in South America is more important to the community than you see in England now, of course, we've kind of gone over this, but do you think there's also a class element to it? That's a really good question. I don't, I don't know. Is mm. is the simple answer? I don't yeah. know about the class element, because now, again, talk about a racing club because it's the club I know. It's the club yes. I love. Yeah. And again, I am from Wales. I live in England. I have not been to Argentina, and yet I have this, uh, this, this now deep-rooted passion for this club so just establish that but the way it's been set up the way it's founded it's a sporting society it mm. is owned by its members it is owned by its socios yeah there are elections for a president victor blanco just won the presidency again a uh, decent president i don't like some of the politics that are going on right now but a decent president so you have that buy-in you have that investment from the people it's the same with Barcelona, not a club I'm particularly fond of in any way, shape or form, but it's owned by its members. Mm. It is supporter owned. And when you have that, when you're not just supporting a corporation, for example, Manchester United, I was raised in Manchester United, so I don't have that same, or, or rather, they don't have that same connection with people, the same as a Racing, a River, a Boca, who are owned by its members, its supporters. So I think, I don't, I don't know how much class is involved. I think it probably is yeah to some extent but i think the the structures around the club um are really really important whereas over here we don't have that some teams will have like supporters trusts or yeah um like youth academies but not on the same scale it doesn't no no a foundation yes but again not on the same scale like you well, said. i imagine the best way to kind of analogize it is to compare it to the way that people care about non-league football here especially lower league football, because obviously I, I live in Chelmsford, Essex at the moment, and the supporters that 
give up so much time for that club for, for nothing in return just out of love and, and so I imagine you understand completely where I'm coming from here oh yeah um but I think something else that w- w- would help bind people to these sporting institutions in South America is the fact of if we pitch at any Brazil team any Brazil national team think of all the different uh ethnic groups you know Caco and Ronaldinho are not from the same ethnic background but of course what do you have binding you together you 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 have this sport which creates a community and that kind of mirrors everything that we've been saying that there isn't a lot of commonality between these people but they have sport and they have their sporting institutions yeah I mean we we see that the world over um yeah and and it's and it's it's wonderful like again sport is the best thing in the world it brings people together through basketball i've met people i've met a lot of people who i would have never never have met you i would have never come across in my life from a range of backgrounds Mm. and i'm I'm really thankful for that yeah yeah well exactly and and that's um such a beautiful attitude to have with sport because i think a lot of sport and sporting clubs think what can the individual do for us but of course what the sport can do for you is is it can open so many doors open your eyes your avenues it's it's fabulous and of course i imagine a lot of people in south america see sport not only as this relief but um, kind of a vehicle for social mobility perhaps i mean absolutely i mean just look at the money that can be made in football yeah you know look at diego maradona obviously arguably the greatest footballer who's ever lived yes he came from abject poverty but he was the most gifted footballer possibly he's ever lived Mm. and he was able to escape that poverty yeah. Now he had horrific people around him, pretty much the way up, especially when he found his way to Europe. Mm. But he was at that social mobility for him and his family was was astronomical. And, and, and again, Greg, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and we we see this model expanded, uh, you know, time and time again. Um, even for players who don't make it out of Argentina or South America, or at least not for long, that their quality of life will forever, assuming that they're able to be at least somewhat sensible, their quality of life will be massively improved secure. through football. Yeah, secure. secure. Well, And that's the thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but Diego Maradona gave a lot back too. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a reason he's absolutely adored. Like he, <laughs> he, was a, he was, aside from being a ridiculously gifted footballer and being a very difficult or challenged, troubled soul, he was remarkably giving to people with time and his own resources and wealth. And God rest his soul too. Of course, a great loss for the football community in the world. And you, you only need, and you, you bring up the example of Jonah Lomu again, look at his funeral. You know, you, you can't tell me the man wasn't adored and cherished and worshipped. And it's much the same with Diego Maradona. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, t- talking to Argentine, my Argentine friends, the day he he passed away, or was, it was announced, they they're heartbroken. They're mm-hmm. absolutely devastated because their idol, you know, the greatest athlete their country has ever seen, the greatest footballer the world has arguably ever seen. Well, both those statements might not necessarily be true, <laughs> but given what I might say later, but you know, that their that idol and the absolute idol of the Argentine footballing ideal come to life. Um, you know, gone. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's taken, taken a, a sad note, this one. <laughs> but of course, well, what, what you were saying about um, the social mobility is also true for, for America, just in very different forms, because of the way that the college basketball system works and the college football, college at NCAA, you can be very good at your sport, get a full scholarship, get a four-year degree, get out of it, out of wherever you're trying to get out of, and then, then your life's changed. Um, it's just, of course... A lot, a lot of the people going through the system are obviously coming from abject poverty too. It just looks very different to, to South America. So let's move on to Racing. Tell me all about them. Tell me about their history. So Racing Club de Abeixoneda uh, are based in Abeixoneda, which is it's uh, part of Buenos Aires province. Uh, not t- strictly speaking in the city of Buenos Aires, obviously the capital of Argentina, but, you know, urban sprawl cities grow and it's sort of been consumed but it's still got its own identity it's quite an industrial uh, area and there are there are three major clubs in um Aveshaneda. you've got racing club you've got independiente 
Now, the distance between these two clubs, and you if you follow me on social media, you've probably seen me post a picture of our beautiful, perfect stadium and their monstrosity mm. next door. It's literally, we have a couple of training pitches and a swimming pool, and then it's it's their gaff. So they're really close together. I think it's a it's a less than a hundred meters between the two clubs or something like that. So even closer than Goodison Park and Anfield then. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's some small distance than Stanley Park, hmm. uh, and the other club being Arsenal de Sarandí, founded by Julio Grondona, who was the president of the AFA until his uh, death in office after the 2016 World Cup. Um, so, yeah, the Racing they wear the so this is their their badge, their logo. I don't know if this is a video podcast, but they wear the the blue and white stripes, black shorts, white socks is their traditional colours, mm-hmm. and they have been in their past history remarkably successful um seven championships in a row in the 20s so the unique uh unique uh, het campion the the first uh het campion champions so seven time champions that's something that is really proud in the history of racing club um through to the 50s and 60s they were the most successful team in argentina overtaking alumni now alumni were the dominant force of the early early 1900s and they have 22 championships they are still fifth in the number of championships won by a single team and they've been out of existence for close on 100 years right so <laughs> that's just let's just talk i don't know why i'm talking about alumni but there we are so racing now the reason i first found out about racing as a kid was because of that famous uh, the battle of montevideo against celtic in the third, uh, sorry, in the replay of the Club World Cup, as it is known now, what is it then? The Intercontinental Cup. So Racing, known as El Primer Grande, the first grande, because they were the first big club in Argentina, really. They were the first to win the club or the Intercontinental Cup from Argentina. So they'd beaten um, Nacional of Chile, uh, sorry, of uh, Montevideo in the Copa Libertadores, and then they beat Celtic in the Intercontinental Cup. So that was like the glory days, the 60s, the late 60s in particular. And then 70s were okay, a bit of a downturn. The club nearly went out of business. There was relegations until the late 90s when they got were owned by this business. And I forget exactly what the business is called, but they were owned by a corporation. And then in 2001, everything started to change a little bit. They won a championship a very young Diego Melito was on that team. It was fan owned again, and it was just a real improvement of fortunes for Racing. Mm. Then throughout the next uh, 13, 14 years, it was, they were okay. They were a, a safe club. They were improving. And then it all changed. Diego Melito came home in about 2014. What happens that first season now a season in Argentina is anywhere from 19 to 30 games right it sounds weird because it is because the format of the season changes every season at the moment it's ridiculous I can explain that a bit more detail later but Milito came back and won the title won the title uh with a with a gutsy 1-0 win at home to uh, Godoy Cruz, a header from Ricky Centurion, a player who came from a horrendous background. Ricky Centurion, really tough background. Um, big Boca fan, sadly, but came through at Racing, went out to Europe after winning the league, played for Boca, came back to Racing. Now he plays for Bella Sarsfield. So he's somebody who's hopefully able to just get himself out mm-hmm. of that situation. And then We've been playing on the continent in a couple of Libertadores, Copa Sudamericana, in the last couple of years. Won the league again a couple of seasons ago uh, with uh, Lissandro Lopez, who had a great career in Europe. And yeah. maybe we're going to get back, um, oh, what's his job? Sergio Romero, who mm. uh, from Manchester United. So that is a really weird round the houses look at the history of Racing. But very successful, got relegated, nearly went out of business relative success and stability has been the key thing. And Diego Melito has recently left the club as um, essentially sporting director. So he was like in charge of the whole professional men's football team. And he has now sadly left the club. Mm. So who are some of the most famous sons of, of Glassing? 
So I've just mentioned yeah, two Milito. there with Licha Lopez and mm. Diego Milito. Mm. Um, we've actually got the new sporting director, Ruben Capria, is another really famous son of Racing Club Derby Schneider. Um, Mago Capria played uh, in the 90s and then came back and is now in charge. Um, of course, you've got the players of the, the 60s, which I'm not going to profess to know <laughs> <laughs> expertly. Um, and in fact, all those names have gone out of my head, which is appalling. And I'm, I'm sorry, I wish Nacho, if Nacho Tierno was here right now, he would be killing me for forgetting some of these the names. The point being that Lassing has, has infiltrated Europe. <laughs> Yeah, um, the academy is really, really strong. Um, arguably one of the strongest academies in uh, South or oh, Argentine football, at least. Mm. Um, players, players who have come through, or at least come through Racing in recent years to Europe. And again, you've got players like um, Marcus Marcus Cunha, who now plays for Sabisha. He is awesome. He should have been playing at the severe level sooner than he did but he's a guy that we got from Faro he developed it at Racing and then boof off he went um players like Roger Martinez came through the academy a little bit before finding a way to Europe and uh Mexico mm. um yeah we we've got of course Lautaro Martinez how could I forget Lautaro Sorry. yeah <laughs> it's just sorry it's just one of those where it's like oh yeah Lautaro of course he watching his development from hearing rumours of we've got this kid in the reserves who is could be a bit special to seeing his breakthrough mm-hmm. and it seemed like he perpetually hit the post uh, but the link up between him and, and Lucha Lopez I think taught him an awful lot and now he's he's going to go on to be the best striker in Europe in a couple of years if he isn't already well go away for Lewandowski to retire first I mean yeah yeah to be fair Mm. To be fair, but you know, we'll put, put Lewandowski in a proper league, and we'll see what happens. Well, of course. Well, we, we, we're going to get on to that. But it, it's it's curious how many, of course, all across the park, they've had talented players. But how many talented wingers Argentina has produced? Even recently, you have uh, Lovetsi, you have uh, Rodrigo Palacio, Messi. I mean, we've <laughs> we've we got uh, Matias Serracho. We've just sold sold him again. Another academy product. Uh, it's quite funny. There's a picture of him from the 2014 title celebration. He's a ball boy. He's a ball <laughs> boy because he's coming through the club. And then in the 2018, he's there. He's lifting the trophy. He's balling his eyes out. He's just been sold to a club in, in Brazil. Hmm. Um, yeah. And it, again, the reason that Argentina have so many of these creative, beautiful players like we've just mentioned is the ideal, like the the angel with de- with deity faces. It's the book by Jonathan Wilson, which if you've not read it, you must. He's the best sports writer alive. I'm just going to come out and say that. Um, that's the ideal, like this street urchin, the the the, the Mar- just picture Maradona, yeah. And that is the ideal Argentine footballer come to life. The way he plays, the trickery, the guile, the shaggy hair, you know the the way he's able just to make people look silly. I love the Argentine league. It's my favourite football league to watch in the world, hands down, has been since I started watching it in about 2011. Because it's a mixture of some absolute thuggery. Like, you have to go out of your way to get a book in an Argentine league. You yeah. really do. It's Some of the, some of the fouls, it's just like, I've been watching too much Premier League. Yeah. But... Um, but at the same time, there can be beautiful, incredible moments of skill and, and just really high quality stuff, particularly from individuals and particularly from from wingers, because that's that's what they like, essentially. Well, people grow up watching what, people like Maradona and that's what they want to emulate. I imagine a lot of it's born from the favelas and, and from, you know, in, in basketball, we call it street ball, obviously. Yeah. And you, you hear about um, people that grew up in like section eight saying, well, you know, I watch a lot of street ball as a kid and that's where I get, you know, all my crazy handles from. I imagine that's what they, you know, who goes down to your local football pitch to work on uh, organising a low block with your mates or to, or working on, you know, shielding the ball. You, you work on your skills. That's what people want to do. I imagine that that's, you know, you, you think about some of the greatest Brazilians of all time, you know, you, you think of, you know, 
Pele, you think of Kaka, Ronaldinho, you know, even those that did, weren't to those heights, but still had Felipe Anderson, crazy amount, amounts of skill. Yeah, people a lot like... of it's cultivated there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hear stories about how Pele and, and Garincha and all, all those players, how they grew up and, you know, bare feet, tight spaces. Same with Uruguayan football. Now, remember, Uruguayan football was the best football on the planet in the 20s and 30s. Where did they? Absolutely. And the Olympics. That, that yeah. I mean, some of the footage from the 1928 Olympics, I want to say. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. 1928 Olympics. Some of the football that Uruguay play is modern football. It's absolutely beautiful stuff. It is mind blowing. It's just like, what am I watching? I'm watching 2020 football. But the, the skills that they learn, they learn these in these really tough environments, these with you know lots of need for close control and trickery and getting around these tight spaces with people who are just going to beat you. Yeah. 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 And that and that that moves us on perfectly to something that's it's a bit of a, a tricky point now is how do we how or how should we regard the sports people of the past now of course Pele is regarded by some as the greatest player ever likewise with Maradona but there is it's become kind of the uh, the discourse now that we kind of disregard that because one they're playing at a different time and two in specifically in Pele's case he never really proved himself on a club level outside of Brazil now, of course, in basketball, we have the same sort of comparison where people say, well, look, from basketball, the game's changed. Wilt, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, they just, OK, Wilt maybe, but Bill Russell just couldn't hang with the, with the skill set you need to play now. How do you think we should regard the sports people of the past? Highly, very highly. Um, now, the, the, the one that I want to check mm. is how many Copa Libertadores did Pele win? That's, that's, that's my first question. I'm actually... And do a sneaky bit of googling, so I apologize there. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so he won two, he won two Copa Libertadores 62 63, uh, two intercontinental cups. Now, the intercontinental cup has always been taken really seriously by South American teams. And back in the day, prior to like 1967 68, when um, Celtic couldn't kick as well as the Racing, and when Manchester United lost at Estudiantes de la Plata, uh, where the witch played. The uh, one Sebastian Veron's father played for Estudiantes. Anyway, um, so he, how do we look at players from the past? We should look at them really highly, like especially footballers. Like, look at George Best. George Best, uh, who my granddad, who I go to, you know, font of knowledge for football for me because it's my granddad. He maintains that George Best is the best footballer he's ever played, he's ever seen, which I'm not going to argue. I wasn't there. You look at what they did with that equipment, with those footballs, on those pitches, with the rules of the day that allowed you to do whatever you wanted to an opposition attacking player. They're under underappreciated. No blood, no if you foul. To put, absolutely. If you, I mean, if you put George Best onto today's pitches with everything, all the modern advantages, he would almost certainly be the best player who's ever lived. I, I, I maintain that. Well, with, I, I, with, I, I see with a strong you're from entirely with the um with the modern advantages thing because if if you was to give George Best a backroom staff that knew how to take care of his body, stopped him drinking and smoking at half time, maybe maybe that made him better. Who knows? Maybe my, my, my granddad says the same. He was evacuated to uh, the potteries in in the Second World War. He tells me that Stanley Matthews was the greatest player he's ever seen play. Yeah. Oh, I had the longevity on Matthews. What was he? Like he played till 70. He was playing non-league football until 70. That's what when the did he, when did he is. When did he win his last FA Cup? How old was he then? I'll check quickly. If you want to fill gaps talking about Pele. <laughs> well, I, I, my, my granddad met Stanley Matthews once on yep. a train coming back from an FA Cup final that United had just lost. I think it was 1948 final to Blackburn. I can't remember. Mm. Um, no, I mean... Pele, obviously, great player. I don't have him as number one all time, personally. Sure. Um, but I'm always going to listen to the argument. Again, what he did in World Cups. I mean, knocking Wales out of the 1958 World Cup is always going to count against him. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. But one thing that he did was he scored a lot of goals. But he scored a lot of goals in nothing friendlies. That's not taken away from his six league championships and his 10 Paulista championships, which is the Sao Paulo regional tournament because Brazilian football is still somewhat federalised or federated rather. 
Um, but you can't take away the World Cups. You can't take away what you see on the film. The guy yeah. was a prestigious mm. goal scorer and, yeah, one of the top five players who's ever played the game. Yeah. And and at the end of the day with Pele, look, he got it done for the prisoners of war in uh, Escape to Victory. So what, what more can you ask from that? It says on Stanley <laughs> Matthews, he helped Stoke to um, second division titles in 1933 and 1963. So there's a bit of the window of the longevity in the geezer. That is longevity. Like LeBron James has got nothing on Stanley Matthews. Not yet. No, what a sentence. I never thought <laughs> that one said. Um, but yeah, of course, we have to understand that, yes, okay, if you put a prime Maradona on the pitch with a prime uh, John Terry, John Terry physically might have it because of the way that we train now. Maybe. Possibly. I mean, I, I see I see your argument. And yeah. yeah, John Terry was one of the top defenders yeah. from England of the last 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, but you're putting him against the second greatest player who's ever played the game. Quite possibly. I still, I, I still think Maradona. I still think Maradona is going to have enough guile, at least, to get past him. I don't know. Um, I mean... Where did he play? He played in Italy. He played against Napoli. some of the best defenders who have ever lived. Yeah, playing for Napoli. You know, playing Italian football in the nineties. Yeah, I mean, you don't get better defenses than I think domestic football in Italy in the early nineties, aside yeah, from the Nemanja right. Vidic in Rio Ferdinand. Quite possibly, you know? yeah, yeah. And that, that, but of course, that's. I think it's it's taken for granted now that you have to regard past epochs in sports as their own individual things because the game has changed yeah. so much you know you look at um you know the 1986 england team if you look at the, the physical makeup of those men they <laughs> they look like sunday league players honestly some of them the thing that really excites me and, and i'm glad you mentioned like sunday league or, or lower leagues earlier as well i watch a lot of uh, welsh domestic football because i'm i'm a proud welshman um and i love and I'm blown away every time I watch it. And when I watch Cambridge United, for example, uh, my local team, the skill level of these footballers is through the roof. They are so talented compared yeah. to, let's say, League One footballers or, or division, old Division Three footballers 20 years ago. Yeah, It's just amazing how far the game has come. Yeah. Even, oh, even right, right down... Right down, right down the levels, and and that's that's a that's a physical thing, that's a training thing, that's a you're exposed. Like it's so much easier now to go on YouTube and be like, I want to do the 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 Elastico that Ronaldinho yeah. used to do. Let me see that. How do I? Let's get some guy to break it down for me. Yeah. Whereas players in the past, they just had to work it out on their own. Like yeah. Georgie Best learned how to be two footed by belting a football with both feet against the garage door in 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 Northern Ireland. You know. Yeah. So. The advantages are there. And I agree with you that we need to look at football and all sports in their own eras. Is, is Jordan the best player, basketball player of all time? We're not getting into that debate right now. I'm just going to tell you that. Maybe. Is he the best player of his generation? Almost certainly. Yes. I would say certainly. Yeah. You know, is LeBron the best player of this current generation? Yeah. Unquestionably. Mm. Um, but with... With all sports as well, we can't just look at like the conditions and the atmosphere and and the physical uh, capabilities of the players. We have to look at the rules as well. Like I'm, I think about how the offside rule in football has changed over the years. And even I think 2004, there was a, a, a little tweak, but it's actually turned out to be massively significant to the way football was played. It opened up the pitch by 20, 30 metres on either side of the halfway line. So, it, you know, these small changes have yeah. huge impacts of how the game is played and some changes can end a career overnight and it can make a career overnight for somebody else. Well, that, that's a, there's a fantastic point there. If you take Roy Hibbert, who for a good couple of years was one of the best centers in the league. Yeah. And then um, I forgot who the Pacers were playing. I really do. And I, I think, you know, hate myself for it, but Roy Hibbert basically lost the job overnight when they figured if they, if, the guy that Roy is guarding, if he stands on the three point line, Roy Hibbert doesn't know what to do. Yeah. And then Roy Hibbert doesn't, therefore doesn't have a function. And was it that heat? Was it the, that heat series? It might have been, but at the same time, I don't think it would have been Chris Anderson sitting on the three point line. Mm. 
Um, unless they had him on Bosch, but even then we had David West at the time. It, I can't remember who it was. I can't remember. It was, a, it was definitely around, it was one of those, seasons, like maybe 2014. Right. Yeah, I think it might have been Toronto, maybe Jonas Valanciunas, unless that's a little bit late. Can't remember. But the point being, these little rules and these little fine bits of my new CI change it. And of course, funny you mentioned Cambridge and the school and the skill level. I once watched Cambridge play, I believe it was Crew. Cambridge 1 0 down. We have a late corner. David Ford comes up for it. Of course, he does. It's David Ford. David Ford gets the ball and he tries a Cruyff turn on the left wing, um, trips over his own feet. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's any more about David Ford. So- or- I saw, I saw um, Manchester United versus Cambridge United at the Abbey on my birthday, 2015, I think it was. God, Was that where Luke um, Chadwick played? Yeah, Luke Chadwick played. He came back. I saw Luke Chadwick play for United against Everton back in September 2001. It was mm. quite quite the journey we've both been on since that time. Um, and I forget exactly which player it was for, for Cambridge. He went on to play in Scotland, but he, he put it through Danny Blinn's legs on the wing and we just went berserk. And it, you know, like, it's like, I think I saw, was that the promotion season? No, they've been promoted the season before, but you know, Cambridge players talking about, Oh, I'll just get this United player out of my pocket from like a little bit of good skill and good, good fortune. Josh Coulson, man. I love Josh Coulson. But if he'd have been able to keep his head down that day. Ah, well, well, he would have had two bars in the place instead of one, weren't he? <laughs> but um, I had the stadium named Tom Knowles last year, who's now at Yeovil, but Cambridge boy. We had Tom Knowles. Um, in fairness, I saw Lewis John in Nando's in Cambridge. So, rushes with fame, of course. <laughs> so, you know, we're saying that we have to kind of regard the sports people of the past in our own little, for want of a better word, in current climate, but bubble. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's fair because I love the way that you um, sum it up with Jordan. Best player of his generation, undoubtedly. If you put that exact Jordan, with, you know, with Pete, Bill Simmons does this in his podcast. He said, if you take this player and you put him through, you know, modern training, get him shooting 500 to 1,000 frees, look, they'll translate. Skill level yeah. like that just doesn't, you know, they would have figured out his shot or whatever. But, uh, he would have translated into baseball had they not had a lockout season. I, I'm, I am adamant of that. I, I agree because I think he's that kind of personality. Yeah. And also like body type. Six foot he, six he was, athletic. <laughs> yeah, really athletic. Super athletic, super fit, fantastic longevity. If he could put back behind ball, what more do you need? Yeah, I mean his his average in the in the Arizona Winter League was not terrible. It was not quite three hundred, but it was, I was, it was, it was back there. to eight, weren't it? I think so, yeah. Something yeah. like that. I want to say two two eight two nine. Mm. Two eighty, two ninety. Yeah, yeah, but no, Jordan. I mean, there's seven podcasts in that alone. Yeah, yeah, but of course. So w- when we're regarding South American sport, and I kind of mentioned it earlier with regards to uh, this ethnocentrism. The the big theme here is uh, is native sport and uh, Iberian sport because they brought uh, bullfighting over, and equestrian is very big amongst the higher classes in a in south america from from what i understand yeah i know polo's a pretty big thing in argentina yeah uh, again in the upper, yeah. upper classes well i was reading about a sport called pato which is basically a portuguese word for duck um it's basically quidditch play on horseback and um you put a lot you used to put a live duck inside a wicker basket and you throw it in a basketball hoop that's standing up like that it's basically quidditch and uh, that that's was the national sport of Argentina for a while. That's amazing. I know there's um there's there's a sport in in Argentina uh, called padel, mm. which is essentially tennis inside of a squash court. Right. Um. Yeah. One of the one of the uh, fantastic filial members. And if you want to become a filial member, check us out at Racing Club UK on the social medias. Um. Yeah. Uh, Diego of our filial. Hey Diego, check this out. Uh, he he's a fantastic pedal player down in mm. down in London. But yeah, just, yeah, there you go. Well, there's also, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to talk about motorsport because that's another a big love of mine. But there's there's this unique um, like touring car in in Argentina that used like the silhouette of a car that's not been in production since the 1960s. Right, and and it's like the, the highest level of domestic motorsport 
in Argentina. I forget what it was. It's like TC or TCR or something. And people literally have these like silhouettes of these cars tattooed on their bodies. They're such big fans of this domestic motor series where all of the circuits look pretty identical bar, bar the beautiful one that goes around the track, which I, uh, sorry, around the track, around the lake. I forget exactly what it is. It used to be, a, it's an FIA rated circuit. I can't mm. remember what it's bloody called now. No, but that's beautiful. It, it's, it's amazing to see what sport can be for people. And of course, my dad's a massive fan of motorsport and we'll get onto it very shortly. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that kind of wraps it up for South America. What all, all that we really have to say is, you know, South America is such a beautiful place for sport. And it's it's everything we, we you know, the Br- Brazilian Olympics was uh, was amazing. It was amazing to see what sport can mean for those people. So if, if we move uh, on to, you know, slightly... Just, 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 just one, one more thing I just want to mention. Mm. Um, it is the Copa Libertadores final coming up. I think it's on Saturday and it will be on the BBC. So it's worth a watch. It's two, South, uh, it's two Brazilian teams, unfortunately. I think it's um, Santos and Palmeiras. Um, but, you know, that's going to be that's going to be a really good final. It's going to be really interesting, really worth a watch. Uh, the last year's final was fantastic, as was the year before. It's a shame that it's gone to one leg. It used to be much more interesting with the two legs, but... Hmm. but do you change with the time. Treat yourself, put that one on. 100%. So... Of course, you're, you're, you're very well versed in Spanish um, and you follow an Argent. <coughs> I'm not well versed in Spanish. I'm trying. I am trying. <laughs> if, I am trying. You follow Argentinian football. Yeah. Do you have a particular favourite Argentinian phrase? Now, I asked Mike Tuck his favourite Yorkshireism and he said it was A up duck. Um, I, don't, I don't think I do have a, have a favourite Argentine or a South American ism that I can think of right now and i mm. i apologize for that uh if if one comes to me i will i'll mention it but just i don't know it's probably something related to racing <laughs> just be uh, so like one of one of the racing songs is racing move when amigo like my good friend mm. which is how i feel about the club myself so mm. it's it's not a great one it's not a mike took a up duck but <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be the benchmark now this this part of the podcast is the is the a up duck presented by mike tuck uh, <laughs> but my, my, i tell you what mine's my favorite south americanism is probably uh the repetition of goal on the scoring of a goal yeah i so i used to i used to do a bit of the old um i still do actually uh but i used to do commentary of argentine football on this website called rabble tv which was literally just me and maybe 10 to 15 people listening to me providing radio commentary on an Argentine football. It was, it was fantastic. It was awesome. I loved it. And I tried that a couple of times, you know, the old Golazzo. Yeah. Oh, nah, it was not for me. It could never be me. Yeah. I was just like, oh, it's a goal, Acuna. Yeah. You know, that kind of business. Well, that's the thing. You've got to put your own stamp on it, isn't it? You know, m- m- not everyone could do a mic brain bang. No, I'd nor should they. No, no. Just save it, save it for the man himself. Just keep, you just leave it, leave it to him. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a funny one with 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 commentary. We we do lean on other people's work. I've stolen um, Niall Gray's the three point play, the old fashioned way, predominantly as a rib. Um, I, I mainly nicked it just so I could say it, and he'd like send me a message being like, "You did it again. You stole my thing." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, it made me laugh." There you go. <laughs> and now Niall Gray's getting a mention here, so. So he'll be happy. Good on you. Good on you. He was commentating yeah. this evening, commentating about European basketball. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah. And, uh, you yeah, know, obviously I nick segments from everywhere. You know, the starting oh. five at the end is blatantly a ripoff of the old man in the freeze draft. I know it is. JJ Reddick will never hear this, so I'll never get in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, we move on. Um, so we've kind of dabbled on it throughout the pod. Who's your GOAT? Any level, any sport, who is your GOAT? So what def, define GOAT? What, Who what to you what, is your greatest of all time? Your your favorite sports person, anything. When you think of sport, who typifies sport for you and what you love about the uh, well about the discipline? That's a that's a tough question because you know my my immediate reaction is to go to my my favorite player who and I've I've had loads of favorite players and it's probably gonna be a footballer. Hmm. Um, like my favorite football, like so. My Twitter is Awade's Touch, 
And Luciano Awed, over the time that I really started watching Racing, which was from early 2014. So I've been following for two years and then I, they started putting games up on, on uh, YouTube, which is super easy to watch because of Football para Todos, where the Argentine government was just like, how football? And I was like, thank you very much. And my favourite Racing player was always Luciano Awed, who was just this pretty functional, but talented enough midfielder like a bit of a holding midfielder could go up a bit love the shot bit a bit of michael a little bit of michael carrick a suggestion of michael carrick mm. to his game Definitely. where he just loved to hit it from distance and scored a couple of times yeah um shades of the kevin nolan <laughs> yes yes though he did score and he's got one cap and one goal for argentina and his his one goal is an absolute screamer. I would retire to on, on the on the turn. I think I think it's one cap, but on the turn, edge of the area against Venezuela, just reefs it. Sends it. Um, so I mean, that's that's like my go to answer for like favorite hmm. player, but but greatest athlete who's ever lived. I mean, it's. I think it's probably LeBron. I, I would probably oh, lean I LeBron. Know. He's yeah. certainly not my favourite. He's not my favourite athlete. He's not my favourite basketball player of all time. That goes to Paul Pierce or, or Melly Greta. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got to be LeBron. Like the, the work that man is doing so yeah. long into his career, playing at such an incredible elite level. He had 47 the other night, was it? 46? That's just disgusting. It's absurd. Like, how, how old is the guy? He's like 38, 36. 39? Yeah. 36. Okay, so he's not as old as I thought he was. Yeah, he's a tyke, isn't he? But he's not exactly slowing down. No, um, that's a scary thing. So it, it's probably LeBron. Um, I think the greatest footballer ever is Leo Messi. Um, <laughs> and I was very resistant to that for a long time. <laughs> but the volume of scoring... The way his games adapted, the way that he'd have at least one World Cup if Gonzalo Higuain wasn't a complete waste of space. And I'm not an Argentina fan necessarily, except for when it's full of wrestling players. Of course. Um, but yeah, uh, so th those are my two. And it's, it's it's kind of boring to go for modern day players as <laughs> as the best, but it's a safe answer though. It's well, I think probably safe not. answer. But I, I think I think you could put Messi in any era. Mm -hmm. Assume, assume you've got 16-year-old Leo Messi yes. with the body of 16-year-old Leo Messi. You're able to put him in pretty much any era, and I think he still translates yeah. in a, in a, in a Maradona-esque you know, fashion. Yeah. The, the, the only thing I worry about is um, someone like uh, <laughs> um, Butch. Uh, no. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm worrying about someone like Baresi just, um, well, actually killing the boy. Like heart stopped on pitch levels of of tackle. <laughs> I mean, he he grew up playing uh, organized, but he grew up playing football in Argentina. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he left young, but that's a tough place to play football. Yeah, especially when, um, when he had his he was diminutive as a child too. Yeah, yeah, he was he was really really sm really small. I mean, I think an another answer that I would give shout out to John Charles that. Uh, the second greatest footballer to ever come out of Wales, uh, sadly eclipsed by Gareth Bale. Um, but John Charles, like world class in two positions. He was a great centre forward. He was a great centre back. He played for Juventus in the 50s. He'd score and then he'd go play centre back. You're not a Ryan so, Giggs fan or? I am a Ryan Giggs fan. Uh, slightly sullied by his off the field pursuits, which matters to me. It, it does matter to me. Um, Whatever. Especially. Is of, of the sport of the nation. Yeah, of course. Like growing up, growing up Wales in the nineties, like Gar like uh, Gary, uh, sorry, Ryan Giggs was, was everything. He, he yeah. was everything to me as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. He was my absolute idol. Gary Speed, uh, little oak. I never had that feeling for him as a, as a kid, because he played for teams that weren't Manchester United. But I, yeah, you know, when he put on the national shirt, you, you loved him. It was the same with like Robbie Savage. Love Robbie Savage <laughs> when he put on the national team shirt. Yeah. But um, no, Ryan Giggs was, you know, growing up, I thought he was the, the best thing ever. Um, so it's weird, yeah. And I, I really, really, I really enjoyed what Beckham did. Like the, the just his... He is underrated. David Beckham is such an underappreciated footballer because of all the other stuff, because he's a wildly successful man in other pursuits. Well, that's exactly it. 
yeah, and and that his his football is sort of forgotten, but his his time at United and his time in Real Madrid, he was just world class. His his crossing ability, he couldn't beat a person, but you didn't need to if he had <laughs> enough room to put in a cross. Yeah, you know, he scored over fifty goals for United, like for, for just phenomenal. What the last of a dying breed, though, because of course you see David Bentley, who was you know no disrespect to David Beckham, but of a similar mould as David Beckham. His career was done by 2013 14. Didn't, didn't have the mentality. Yeah. From, well, from everything I've read, I've never met David Bentley. Or no, nor, nor can I speak, of, speak on his character. But from everything I've heard, he didn't have the mentality. He didn't, and he didn't have, he never had Alex Ferguson. Mm. And Alex Ferguson, the greatest football manager who's ever lived. And I'm not having any argument. Uh, Bella Gutman is in that conversation, of course. But, um, the, what he was able to do and how he was able to bring through that class and they were remarkably grounded like even David Beckham with like the, the rock and roll lifestyle the pop star wife and all that it, the football still obviously always came first to him it, yeah. it went a bit at the end of his time at United and then he went off and became a bloody Galactico but w- that's the key difference it, having a head coach or a manager like Alex Ferguson, changed David Beckham's whole existence. Mm. Um, because you put him, a player with that talent, but he wasn't that talented. It, I mean, he, he obviously he was, but he worked at that talent. He didn't have it's, a full it, package. It's what I love about Cristiano Ronaldo and why Cristiano Ronaldo is one of my favourite players. Um, again, I remember his, watching his debut at, for United and it was just like, what is this? I've never seen anything like it. And from that moment, I was like fascinated by the guy. But he he obviously had talent. Of course you do. If you're a professional athlete, you've got talent. Yeah. But the work he's put in and built his game is just astronomical. Mm-hmm. And that's what I respect the most. And Bentley had Ross talent and he, he obviously worked. Of course he did. He didn't get but to he, London, no reason. But who, but who did he have around him? Who did he have above him? Yeah. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> Harry Red, was he Harry Red? Was, um, he Harry Red it was, the, was it not the Spanish manager? Uh, oh, Ronde Ramos. Yeah, was it not I mean, it, it was a revolving door at Spurs. Well, at that yes, time. it was. Yeah, but mention, you mentioned how didn't you mention Alex Ferguson? I'm going to say a name, and I'm interested to hear your opinion. Ravel Morrison. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that sounds like Ravel Morrison. That's it's it's just it's sad. Like yes, it is. There were people within United who genuinely thought he was going to be the best player Bullshit. maybe ever to come through that club. <laughs> yeah. You know, arguably. Like, I'm sure, I'm, I don't know if I'm making this up, but there's Duncan Edwards levels of of hype around Ravel Morrison. And it just didn't quite didn't quite work out for him. Like, he, he went on to have a fine career, played all over the world. It's, it's made yeah. him, hopefully, a lot of money. And I hope he's had some fantastic experiences. But it, it's a shame that he never... Fulfilled that potential. Well, as, as a West Ham fan, of course, uh, the, the goal against Tottenham will never, you know, and the 3 0 win at White Hart Lane will always be in my memory. But I remember I went to go watch this in a pre season friendly against Patras de Ferreira <clears throat> that the season, uh, yeah, the start of that season. 15 seconds in, Kevin Nolan kicks off to Val Morrison. He dribbles forward about 20 yards, puts one top corner, 1 0, 15 seconds. And you start to think, why isn't this boy the first name on the team sheet every week? But of course, yeah. we don't see what I mean, why, why isn't he like England international? Robert well, yeah, there, there was the, the viral clip of him um, scoring a... He, he jumped and did a Rabona midair off a cross in England training. It was ridiculous stuff, ridiculous stuff. And of course, you know, should he be in the reserves of Sheffield United? No, not really. I mean, uh, not off, not off talent, not but off, yeah, off, off the rest of it. But... They're, they're, they they talk about this, don't they? They say there are there are training players and there are game day players, and yeah. you know some. And you hear about this at, at United, at Manchester United during the day. You know, you'd have these players who were amazing in training, but mm. come match day, they just couldn't do it because the pressure was was too much. Like um, now, what I, another one of my absolute favorite players of all time, Diego Forlan which is a, a controversial one as a wrestling fan because he, he did play for the other lot. Sure. But um, he only scored 10 goals at United. Uh, he was young and it was it was a tough 
like you know transition first club in Europe, blah blah blah. Um, and he he got a lot of treatment by the media over here, but undoubtedly, question you know great player like two Pachichi uh, awards, two European Golden Boot, just phenomenal once he'd left United. But you know there are those difficulties that that players face. You know converting raw talent to to whatever sport and it a tangible talent yeah 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 yeah. yeah that's a, that's a good yeah that's a nice way of putting it yeah yeah i mean we, we all have it in us we all have a peak and uh you might never meet the right coach and it, can, it, and it can be that simple it really can be that simple so what does the next five years look like for you because of course lots of big things have been happening for you recently for me for you Personally. yeah Ooh. Ooh. yeah that's, that's, that's... <laughs> without, without giving in any, any anything in the uh, in the uh, pipeline. No, nah, uh, gee, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. We're all the same. You know, I don't think more than two weeks ahead these days. Um, <laughs> Can't afford to. No. I mean, realistically, <laughs> I I want to keep keep doing a lot of a lot of what I'm doing. Um, mm. You know, this this season, my first full season commentating for London Lions, and and that's been that's been the greatest. That's been the best. Best experience of my life in the country, yeah. Best best basketball team in the country, yeah. I think that's fair to say. Yep. Uh, certainly the most entertaining team in the country. They are they are yeah. great oh, fun to watch. Cool. Yeah, and and they have been. I mean, I don't know about off the court, but certainly on the court, they're just you know loaded with talent. Yeah, and, and this is the thing I I really like about London Lions, and I'm not a London Lions fan, though. When people start, you know, like there's trolls and haters out there being like, oh, London, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I get a bit defensive, sure. but you know, I, I work with, I work for the club. So it may be as part of that, but I've been around that club now for, I don't know how many years, three, four years. I, I lose track of time. And I've seen the building blocks of what we see today and, and what we should have seen on Sunday. Mm. And unfortunately didn't get a chance to, but I've seen the, the slow build of this, of this club and this organization. And it's, it's been organic. It's been bit by bit. Yeah, they've had this, this, this money come in, which has really helped maybe accelerate a little bit this process. But um, I think I think, no I think they're just City. no other I'll... city could have done it, and no other Vince McCauley, no team without Vince McCauley would have acquired this funding. I think he is where to to say this is London's success. You, you have to say it's just as much as Vince McCauley's success, considering everything he's done for that organization. A hundred, hundred percent, hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, he's been the driving force behind it since, since the day he took back over uh, Chargers head coach from Coach K. Marius, yeah, Marius Carroll. You saw the difference. There was a big overhaul, and there was a lot of people that weren't particularly happy with how their role changed or how they were no longer a London Lion. You saw that roster transformation over a couple of weeks. And then again, that next summer yeah. to what we see today. And, and it's, it's been really exciting being on, on, on this, on the outskirt outsides of this journey, just watching it from real close. Yeah. Uh, and now I get, and now I get to commentate all the games next to Nigel Lloyd, who was obviously a legend of the game. And mm-hmm. uh, I think the first person I ever interviewed in basketball other than uh, Vince yeah. was, was probably Nigel Lloyd after a Lions game. Who is the goat to BBL too. Yeah, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to agree with you there. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's, he's fantastic. So, yeah, what do I, what do I want the next five years to be? I want more success. Firstly, for Racing Club Derby Schneider, mm-hmm. I want to continue and grow the commentary and do more. And um, yep. I want to still be, hopefully, Lions commentator at that time. Maybe do, you know, maybe do more in British basketball commentary. Of course. If, if I'm still in the Cambridge area, I'd still love to be doing things with Anglia Ruskin University, uh, particularly their women's team. I, I love commentating their women's team. The men's team is great. Men's, they're fantastic fun to watch. They're a really nice bunch. They Their games are fun. That game against um, Northampton Titans at home last, last year, year in the bunker, <laughs> that was outrageous. That was one of the most entertaining games of basketball I think I've ever seen. And this is D3 men's in yeah. the National Leagues. So that's fantastic. Um, we need a Matt Harper cam for all, for all of those games. What, what an experience it is watching him coach. 
It's, I think he gimmicks, I'm waiting to see, like, if he gimmicked the whiteboard so it just breaks real easy. It's made out of sugar glass or something. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to move into football commentary as well, or, or ice hockey commentary, or, or whatever, whatever mm. commentary. Because, again, for fun, I used to commentate on this website. I used to commentate football, ice hockey, baseball, basketball, the third division Spanish basketball. Um all sorts. So it's just just more of that. Obviously, the focus hoop stuff. Um, we're, we've got a real focus on women's basketball. I'm happy for that to continue to be to be what we focus on and make our little niche over there. Um, because I, I I love women's basketball as well. I think in some ways I prefer it to men's basketball. In some ways, yeah. In some ways I do like. <laughs> WBBL and BBL finals days. I've I've attended quite a few that I've been lucky enough to attend a number of them as, as media. The women's game is always the one I've looked forward to. Yeah, and I wasn't expecting that to be the case. I went into the first one a little bit blind to to women's basketball in this country because I, I I was there for the men's basketball because I've been covering the lines all year, and then I, I I saw that women's game up close and I was like, this is this is the basketball. Yeah, and then the men's game was an absolute blowout, and it's like. I don't know. Well, I was about to say, you know, I've been fortunate enough to watch a lot of basketball live. But the most, probably the most exciting experience I've ever seen live was Helen Naylor, 2019 BBL yes. Cup final, game winning three. Yes, that was that was tremendous. Um, so I was the, I, yeah, uh, that was that was such a great final. Yeah, such a great game. Now she plays for Manchester Mystics, which is just wild. Yeah, um, Judith Fritz playing there too. Um, Cat that was cat car. Yeah, I mean that was a great game. All the all the women's finals have been great. Yeah, and you know I talk talk to people who watch it on TV and they're like, "Oh, it wasn't a great game." I'm like, "You weren't there." <laughs> and it's one of those I find with basketball. I find it a lot. So I commentate for TV, but I find basketball way easier to watch in person and way more enjoyable to watch in person because you understand what's going on better when you can see a lot more of it. And yeah, you, the WBBL finals, you have to be there to really understand and experience like what you are seeing. Mm. Um, because sometimes it doesn't look great on TV. And it's the same with the BBL final. It's the same with every every game of basketball, I think. Sometimes it just doesn't translate. Yeah. But my God, that Helen Naylor shot was just outrageous. Yeah, yeah. And what do the next five years look like for Lassen Club? So we've just got a new... Director Technical, uh, a new head coach, uh, Juan Antonio Pizzi, who was a prestigious, prolific goal scorer back in the day, has been very successful. So he's just come in. Um, I was talking about Mago Capria, who we have an interview with him about to go live over on uh, Split Focus Sports, which doubles as the hub for Racing Club UK podcast and uh, Focus Hoops. Um, so he's just come in as the... Uh, the director of football essentially so change change mm. um exciting a lot of a lot of it is exciting i don't like the change with capria coming in like i'm, I'm happy with capria because <clears throat> he understands what what we're about as a club because he's obviously played for us but i don't like the fact that diego melito is gone and yeah. he's gone because of politics and, it, and it's sure it's it's not great but the, the, the reason I'm really unhappy is because he helped to instill this culture from his playing to his his being a, one of the most important people in the club that has brought success and sustainability. Racing is so sustainable in a really volatile time in Argentina and their economy. And we've been able to you know be nice and steady, good product on the pitch, good football, some dodgy decisions in terms of managers coming in, like Facundo Sava, Kind of ironic because that's my favourite period of racing, but not great. Um, so change, hopefully for the better. We've got loads of kids coming through. We've been awful domestically. Like we made it to the Copa Libertadores quarterfinal, horrific uh, domestically, but it didn't matter. It was a throwaway tournament. Sure. But able to bleed bleed the youth. So I've got a load of kids coming through. So the future could be really exciting. Just need Pizzi to continue that and put the trust in the kids, hopefully bring in a couple of experienced players. Uh, Ezekiel Scalotto from Brighton is supposed to join us, or is, is, it, it's been rumoured that he's joining us uh, on, 
on on transfer being bought by us owned i can't remember the words um, oh, oh, yeah signed <laughs> oh signed signed that's the one so he's 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 supposed to be signing um so that's the football side of things the women's football is going from strength to strength um with a couple of Argentine internationals playing for the women's team. That's becoming more and more professional. Um, we did an interview with Natalie Junkos, who grew up in America. Um, so well worth checking that out. So more coverage of the women. Want them to improve and become the top team in Argentina. I think they have chance for it. And the big thing I want for them is more games at the Cilindro, at the, at the stadium that the men play at. That would be amazing. I want the futsal teams to progress. I want the <laughs> basketball team to get promoted. And, and finally be back at the top table of Argentine basketball. I think that's a long journey, but it's doable. Why not? Goals are goals. Uh, goals for a reason. I hope the boxing guys do really well. I hope the athletics team are very successful. Just want to build the culture. I don't think we've got a baseball team, but yeah. start one. I'm yes. going to take on Ferro yeah. and Platense. Yeah. You see what I mean about it being this, it's more than a football club. It's It's a whole society and it's a whole range of clubs. Sorry, I'm not answering your question. I'm just no, it's fine. It's fine. It's entirely fine. I love hearing people talk about with passion. You know, I think that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. Oh, and also, I hope that all the foundations go from strength to strength. That's no. that's the big thing. Yes, yes, and that, that, that's as you said, the start, the spirit of the organisation. So the last sport. Uh, try again. The last question before we break down into the starting five, which I'm really looking forward to, and I know. I'm going to have to give you a time limit on this one because I imagine you could go on forever. But Probably. my dad and I always talk about, is motor racing a sport? Darren, take yes. it. Simple. Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. It's that simple. It's that simple. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at what these athletes, and let's call them athletes just for the sake mm. of making my point further. Let's see what they have to go through. Physically, you have to be so strong to be a... Uh, a motor, um, uh, a driver, motorsport driver, or even a pit crew. You have to be so strong. The G forces. Let's talk about a prototype uh, LMP1 car. The G forces that are going through your body, the force, the pressure you have to exert from your left leg, the force of G force on your neck, the strength that you have to have to control these 300 plus kilometer an hour vehicles is astronomical. My favorite uh, form of motorsport is endurance motorsport. You know, I've, I've said, my, my wife will say, how long is this race? Oh, four hours. Four hours? Are you having a laugh? That's nothing. What is this? Pathetic. Embarrassing. We don't watch F1 much for pretty much that reason. It's like, like one and a half hours? Is, Get out. What? There's another 23 hours worth of racing there, surely. <laughs> but what these guys put themselves through physically, mentally, emotionally, throughout the race, the decisions that they have to make, the physical inputs that they have to make. Again, I've spoken about the leg, the arms, the necks, the making changes to their, their brake bias and, and all this throughout throughout a, a lap. Of course, the athletes. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Athletes. That's a fantastic no way other answer. That. No. Now, I'm, I must admit, I, I used to sit on the camp of no. Now, part of that was my resistance to not enjoying motorsport just because yeah. that's what my dad always used to watch on Sunday. I never used to enjoy it. Um, and I, I spoke in a previous podcast about maybe, yes, it's a sport, but we should start classifying sport differently as perhaps conventional sport, artistic sports, motor sports, uh, and stuff like that. Um, maybe, because of course with artistic sports, let's take dancing. I, I know many dancers. Dancers train hard, very yeah. hard. There's very a lot hard. required on them mentally. There's a lot oh, required yeah. on them physically. They have to train for a long period of time. But would you class dance a sport? Not particularly. Um, I think that's. Because it, I mean, it, it can be done. Com it can be done competitively. There's a huge, obviously. We've just spoken about the physical side of things. So yeah. why not? Yeah. Why, yeah. Why not? The, the ECU, it, it, in fact, it's graded subjectively. Yes. Yes. That, it that is. Is wrestling a sport? Um, well, professional wrestling. Um, yeah, not. Um, yes, yeah, it is. Of course, it is. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's great. Graded when it is graded is graded yeah. artistically. Yeah, Dave Meltzer. So, there's staff. a way of there is a black and white way of winning. There is, but that's predetermined. Yeah, yeah, same same as boxing. But then, 
the boxing yes <laughs> oh you are gonna get some people bear in mind where you're from mate like you're gonna have some people having words with you hopefully not boxers uh, hopefully <laughs> no no I, I i i you know the the very brief definition of a sport is something that involves physical exertion and is competitive and honestly i i find happiness in sport if it brings you happiness that's good enough for me that's there you go enough. i love that thank you right let's break it down to the starting five now we could do this in two ways you can either tell me yours and i'll tell you mine or we can try a draw <laughs> but we are going to name starting fives any sport any athlete from south america however i need one per nation one per nation that's yeah. that's tough because from argentina i can give you i can, you give can you have so a... many right now yeah but um yeah one, one per nation let's let's see let's see mm. what we can do yeah so do we have to have different people? We're not allowed the same person, I'm guessing. And not allowed the same person, no. No. Not we person. we okay. can each have like a, you can have a Brazilian and I can have a Brazilian, but they can't be the same person. Can't be the same Brazilian. Okay, that's fine. No. That's fine. Okay, uh, yeah, let's let's go back and forth. Let's okay, that gives me a bit of thinking time. <laughs> a bit more thinking time. Um well, in which case I'm gonna be safe. I'm gonna use Argentina, I'm gonna take Leo Messi. Okay. What sorry, remind me the pro I've I've seen terrible team. hit. Top five sports people, but only one per nation. Top five. So is that like my favourite athlete from that nation? Or whatever you want. Whatever best? you want to draft. Whatever you want to draft. Oh, okay, cool. So it's completely subjective. Mm. So if this was England, I could have Simon Russell, for example, who used to play for Cambridge in like 2010. Yes, I mean, I I, I, I prefer Leo Messi personally. Um, I mean, he, subjective. He, did he, did he ever do it against Gateshead on a cold Saturday? No, I've never seen um, him in Port Vale. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> um. All right, so Argentina. Mm. I'm going to go Meli Greta. I'm going to go Meli Greta. She is probably my favourite basketball player. I think she's so cool. Do I need to explain? I'm going to explain Meli Greta. Um, she's the Leo Messi of basketball to me. She's this really cool point guard. She, the way she wears her kit, the way she sees the floor, the way she plays her game, her finishing, she is fearless just attacking the rim she is not big like i say the leo messi of, of women's basketball she's very diminutive with a massive headband drives really hard her shooting her passing her defense is really strong i would love to see her in the league the league uh yeah Meli Greta is, is is my argentine okay followed closely by luciano Oued. i just want to get that in there of course um we'll snake it so you you, you have another pick Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Uruguay, obviously, did before them. Um, just everything about him, I just loved. I, I thought he was just really cool as a, as a kid. I just thought yeah. he was the coolest thing on the planet. The hair, like, so if you if you know me from from years past, you know I have longer. I used to have long hair. I thought he was cool. He made Liverpool look very silly, which was great. And his goal in the two thousand and two World Cup against, I want to say Ghana, but that's probably wrong just one of the best goals I think I've ever seen in my life to that point. So, yeah, Diego Fulham. Hmm. I think I'm going to not waste, not waste my pick mm. for Brazil. I'm not going to pick anyone that you that you would put in your top 10 for Brazilians. I'm going to go for Dida. The, the keeper. Goalkeeper. The keeper for AC Milan. As a, as a kid, I wanted to be Great Dida. keeper. As yeah. a kid, I wanted to be Dida. And now, of course... Famous for his World Cup exploits too. Um, as a kid, I wanted to be Dida all the way throughout my youth. Dida was the best keeper until Buffon and Cassias took took that plinth off of him. Um, I wanted to be Dida. That that was that was it. If I weren't Dida in goal, I was Lampard out pitch. So, yeah, oh, that's, that's a great shout. That's a great. <laughs> and then shout. it's me free. And here's where we start getting a uh, you know we start looking at nations like. Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, Chile, uh, Uruguay for myself. I haven't used Uruguay. Um, I am going to have from Colombia, because he played for West Ham once, Pablo Armero. Okay. The little left-back wing-back. I loved him. He was awful for us, but I loved him. You know, God loves to try. Uh, my next one is Oscar Romero, um, Paraguay. Uh, has a twin brother called Angel. They both play for San Lorenzo now, Casla. Um, but he he played for Racing for a couple of seasons. And he even kept Rodrigo de Paul out of the team. Now, mm. Rodrigo de Paul is one of the best players 
in Italy right now. He's going to be one of the best players in Europe. That his his resurgence he's had in the career. But Oscar Romero, he kept him out of the team. Scored possibly my favourite ever goal, maybe um, in the two two draw against San Martin de San Juan, where he just hits it from about thirty plus yards out. You hear the roar of the cylindro as it goes in. Just, just really, really enjoyed the way he played. You could play on the right. You could play in the middle. Um, his his development on the opposite flank to Marcos Acuna, who could have also been my Argentine pick, was was just a joy to watch because you know then I was watching every single Arsenal game one o'clock in the morning and it, just watching those guys develop. Oscar Romero could have been a bit more. Moved to Europe, moved to China. Now he's playing with his brother and enjoying his football again. Yeah, and then it'll be your fourth pick. Ooh, my fourth pick. I had one in mind and it has gone out of my head. Oh, no, it was another Paraguay, wasn't it? Is that Argentina, Paraguay? You were glad. Oh, uh, let's, let's, go to, let's go to Brazil then. Yeah. Uh, Brazil. Fred. Manchester United's Fred. I'm going to go with it. <laughs> I, I love Fred. Fred has become one of my favourite Manchester United players. Alongside McSauce. It, there's a theme for the players I like. I like centre midfielders. I don't know why. I was never, it could never be me. Sure. I always played on the wing or wing back. But um, yeah, Fred, I just I just enjoy his game. I think he's a relatively smart player, except mm. for that red card he got a few weeks ago. Sure. Just hard working, bit, bit of trickery, bit of guile. Mm. Nice little partnership with McSauce. I, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Fred. For my Brazil, it could have been Anderson. Anderson was was there thereabouts. What, what about Fabio or Rafael? Yeah, g- good players, very good professionals. Um, still having a lovely career, both of them. But the, the Brazilian, uh, course, yeah, didn't didn't quite didn't quite do it in the same way. I mean, what about Cleberson? Hey, yeah, <laughs> if we're, if we're pulling it back, <laughs> pulling it back. Yeah, um, it's my fifth pick now. <laughs> I was going to pick. A man from Ecuador. But now I've picked up on the slight Manchester United theme. I think I might. Oh, he's going for it. He's going for Tony No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll save him. In which case, I'll go for the other side of Manchester. And I'll go okay. for a man that always confused me as a kid because I, I just assumed he was good, but he has the best name in football ever, Roque Santa Cruz. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really good player. Yeah. Yeah, really good footballer. Yeah. And that, and. That's good enough for me. I mean, of course, there's those nations. You know, I was thinking, can we fit Mexico in? If so, I'll have Andy Ruiz, the boxer. Uh, technically, um, North American. Yeah, and and yeah. there you go. I don't, I, I don't want to. I don't want to cause any scandal here. I don't want to offend many people. You know, I'm already doing well with motorsport and boxing. Um, I don't want Andy Ruiz getting on my back twice. Um, so yeah, but so it's me now. Mm, it? so your last pick. I've, I've had Argentina. Yep. Uruguay. Yep. Paraguay, Brazil, Fred. That that one snuck up on me. Even <laughs> Pele sitting in in the back room right now. He would, yeah, it, 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 it would it, like my granddad may have gone Pele, but I don't know. He just not for you. My my lists never work like like this. So no, I, um, I AC Milan kit because of Kaka as a kid. Who could it be? Is it Edison Pooch? Because I kept on. No, he's he's not. He's Argentine. Um, oh come on, it be Alexis Sanchez. It's it's it, it's absolutely not. Who is I've got I've got a name, Go I've, on. I'm gonna have to Google the exact name, but I do know who it is. Um, Peruvian, mm. there it is, Teofilo Cobias. Um, yeah, Peruvian international, I think national team captain in the 60s and 70s, right. <laughs> absolute traction engine of a boot look him <laughs> up on so I, I remember I, i'm terrible i'm dreadful with names sometimes and his is a name i'm pretty terrible with but i remember seeing a, a youtube highlights compilation of him maybe in 2010 maybe before that i think it was my first year of uni so it'd have been 2009-10 and just the free kicks and the skill on this guy was just astronomical mm. um just seemingly could score from anywhere yeah, and that Peru kit, especially, I used to love the red with the white sash, but now I think my preference has changed sure. to the white with the red sash. Uh, 
beautiful beautiful stuff mm. so that, he's my guy if, if we're gonna chuck a, a, a random mexican in yep. there even though it doesn't strictly speaking count um i think georgie can, georgie campos georgie campos maybe not then i was gonna say hernandez oh chicharito hernandez yeah i like chicharito hernandez yeah. um no, why not? and for colombians of course roger martinez yes he's carlos Rama was on my list just for the hair really but, oh yeah oh um, iconic yeah my, my my close runners up were um well, it was claudio pizarro uh, for me oh verde bremen legend yeah by munich and you talk about uh free kicks batistuta Yes, yeah, batter goal, absolutely ludicrous free kick. I'll tell you who takes a good free kick. Um, no, I won't, because his name's gone out of my head. Played for River, played for Everton, centre-back. Uh, Funes Mori. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, one of the Funes Moris. Yes, because there's two the, of them. The better Funes Mori. Yes. Even though the younger, the, the striker, uh, Rahelio went to Monaco, but now he's playing for... Monterrey, the best team in Mexico, with former Racing favourite Nico Sanchez. And when I say favourite, I mean my favourite. That's good enough. The for partnership me. between him and Luciano Lolo. Well, class. I could talk about 2014 to 2017 Racing all day long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll fit in uh, a Costa Rican, if we're counting that. Uh, oh, Piedo. Ooh. Oh, yes. I feel bad for him. That's because I remember That's watching a... that game where his leg just... Uh, well, it, it stopped being a leg, really. Uh, probably behind Kevin Ware and Paul George, probably the grisliest sports injury I've ever seen. It was in the cup. He broke it, it just... You, you know after you're done camping, you like you pull the um, poles apart, you know, and then they just kind of like collapse together. That's what happened to his leg. That's that's horrendous. Yes, it's horrendous. Uh, I think the the worst the worst sports injury was for me. Um, aside from obviously deaths in motorsport, yes. um, Henrik Larsson's leg break. Right, horrendous. Have you seen? Have you seen yes. it? Yes. It's just like no. <laughs> I'd rather not, I'd rather it not happen to me. I'd rather not. It's just yeah. horrible. Yeah, horrible. Um, <laughs> actually, my least favorite sports injury was mine when I broke my hip. So <laughs> that'll do it. That will do it. Jeez. Yeah, it's someone touching. will get top five sports injuries, and uh, yeah, <laughs> touching everything made of wood around me. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my uh, Costa Rican is the keeper whose name has completely gone out of my head, but I think plays for Real Madrid. Oh, um, Real Madrid. Padre Bravo. No, yeah. Yes, yes. No, he's, uh, I wrote... A for, Kaelo Navas, sorry, Kaelo Navas. Kaelo Navas. Fabio that's Bravo's that's Chilean. For, and he's not even the best Chilean keeper. No, that, there's that is, Italy, that's Italy, Gabi, is it? No, Italy. No. Italy, Italy, Italy. Racing Club's own ah, okay, Gabi sorry. Arias. No, right. you like goal, you like goalkeepers, right? Are you, are you like me, part of the goalkeeper union? I used to play as a goalkeeper, yes. Okay. Look up Gabi Arias. Just watch a highlights video of him playing for Defensa de Justicia and for Racing, and I think he played somewhere else in, in between time. He is the best in the world, and this sounds mental, I don't care. He's <laughs> the best of the world at coming off of his line. Right. Like, he's Neuer levels good of meeting, meeting a one-on-one -on -one, uh, attacker. The, we got done 4-0 against River Plate a couple of seasons ago. The only reason it wasn't about 12-0 was because he played out of his skin. We lost 6-1 to River Plate a couple of seasons ago. The only reason it wasn't a million nil, well, a million one, we actually had the lead. It was a horrible game to try and watch. Yeah. Was because he's so good at just sweeping up and dealing with everything. Absolutely brilliant goalkeeper, Gabby Arias. Check him out if you if you, if you you don't know. Now you know. Now we know. And speaking of checking people out, Darren, tell people where they can find you and hear more of you. Oh, uh, I'm on I'm on Twitter. Uh, not super active right now, just you know, taking things easy. But at our Wade's touch, A U E D S T O U C H. If you want to see more of me and this fabulous Barnet, uh, Thursdays eight p.m. unless otherwise stated on the Focus Hoops YouTube channel, Kaz and Daz Show, where we break down all of the world of women's basketball which is going to include this week 
having a look at the uh, Connecticut Sun's new launch of their rebrand, looking at their new colorways and stuff. Hopefully they send us a kit because one thing that I love and I want to do like a podcast, maybe with you, actually, I think you'd be a really good person for this, Thank is you. the aesthetics of sport and aesthetics of sport kit and how it changes over history and over time. I absolutely love that. I'm a massive kit geek. Mm. Um, but yeah, those those are the places. So Focus Hoops, our YouTube channel is, is really quite active at the moment. We have at least one live show a week. And yeah, um, I'm also on Instagram, but that's private. So I wouldn't worry. I love it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Darren, thank you so much for your time. It's been a great talk and it's always a pleasure talking and working with you. And you have listened to What Was the Score? The Sports History Podcast. I've been Jamie, Darren's been Darren. And uh, thank you for spending it with us. Have a good day.